Hi, welcome everybody. Um, first, a little question. Who knows why I chose that particular song today? One, two, three. So this is actually my third time in uh, Stockholm. And the thing I will present today is kind of related to the presentation I gave last year and the year before. So two years ago, I talked about insider threats. Last year, about operator jail breakouts. And now I'll be telling a little bit more about security testing for ICS owners. So I saw on the slide there, on the pop quiz, that there's not a lot of ICS owners in the room, so bear with me. Um, a little spoiler alert, uh, it's not a techie talk, so those who want to leave can feel free to take a beer. I don't mind. And I would like to start with a little Bobby picture. I was hoping to be the first today of little, using little Bobby, but unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, this is actually a very recent little Bobby one. Um, especially here, pen testers can add value, but you need to prepare for actual adversaries. Um, the thing I will present today is real stuff uh, that I occurred in real environments. So you all heard the news that, well, there's urgent patching to be done because of vulnerability X, Y, Z. There's a critical flaw in a PLC and stuff like that. Or security testing cannot be done. Well, always or almost always causes media panic. <clears throat> so how do you really know you're at risk? And how much time do you have to patch or mitigate? Who has an answer to that question? Nobody in the room? So enter security testing of your environment then. Well, scoping of ICS security assessments is almost always limited. It tends to be IT focused and it does not always include all layers. So the point is, do you know what the accessibility is of your environment? Do you know from what points in your environment somebody can enter your network environment or physical environment? Because um, determining the, op the accessibility, should be the next slide already. Um, how easy is it to get the juicy stuff, for example? Uh, and you have to start looking at the bigger picture. So actually take a step back and get back to the basic of your environment. Do not only look at the logical stuff. Do not only look at the human elements. Do not only look at the physical elements. But all combine them together and use some scenarios to determine your security testing. For example, off-site, you have an external person, somebody who is or who can visit your site. And on-site, you have either visitor access, employee access, privileged employee access, so people with badges or extra badges, and guard access. And also, don't forget the cleaning crew or other uh, people walking around. All the things that I will show in the slides have been done without any illegal actions, without breaking attempts, just using what's out there, just what's available. So, Testing your environment, back to basic style, is a combination of whiteboard sessions, physical walkthroughs, and technical testing and scanning. Looking at network architecture, looking at locations with logical access, looking at the accessibility and exploitability of your environment. This might include live testing on live environments. At least that's what I have, the, have been doing. The human element, well, you all know the human element is the weakest element in security. Um, all those nice, helpful people, they not, do not always challenge you. They do not ask, can I see your badge? They do not ask, why are you taking pictures? That's for guards to be doing. And USB dropping, phishing, procedure bypass, technical measure bypass, that's something that will always work. Yeah. So let's move on to the physical side. I will not stand still with the human element too much. But on the physical side, you can look out for perimeter security, your location security, and all that kind of stuff. So everything what your physical security system is built of. Why is that important? Well, um, I think last week, I've run into a situation where the customer said, look, I have my perimeter security is fine. But within the perimeter, nothing of physical security existed. Everything was open, everything was unlocked. 
So that's why you have to test that. That's why you have to verify it. And the reason why they had everything unlocked is because of the unions. The unions didn't want to have people filmed or monitored or action controlled or whatever. So I just told them, why don't you do in your critical areas, do your motion detection over there? Uh, door gaps, there are circulating tons of movies on the internet on how to open doors with some clothing hanger shifted on the door and unlock the door like that and things like that. So it's even possible in the hotel if you haven't noticed. Also look for laptops, desktop, and all that kind of digital equipment within those environments. And the point is to verify all network outlets that you can reach, all USB ports that you can reach, all serial ports that you can reach. Everything that you can put your hands on, connect to it, see what's on the, on the thing. So we try to determine the physical access towards all the logical access paths. These are real pictures taken from one of my customers. The left one is actually um, a computer system with a completely metal case around it. But the thing can swing. So at the back, they had this arm, all cables going through that hole. And if you look good, you see here a tiny Ethernet coupling device. So just disconnect it. Put the Pentest dropping box in there, connect it, and you're good to go. That is it. Nobody will notice. This one is actually the back of a batch reader device. They also had a metal case around it, but they forgot this part. Just pull it out and do whatever you want with it. Now, if you want to do active scanning on batch reader devices, think again. Don't do it. You'll cause a physical denial of service of your environment, because the batch reader device will be rebooting constantly. It's very fun, but not fun when you want to enter the facility, of course, or leave the facility. So, other things. Who is doing physical walkthroughs within the room of his site? Who of those who, hand, who raise their hand is looking up on top rack enclosures or closets? Some of you are lucky ones. Keys on top of racks. This is not from the front door of the rack. Eh? So a little story with these pictures. Um, this is a particular server room I have visited, I think, three or four times. And this I found on the fourth time. The previous time, the door was every time unlocked. The racks were unlocked, so very easy to get into. But this was a forgotten key of a maintenance guy who had done works. The physical door of the room itself was again unlocked. What a surprise, there were works in the building. And this is a rack, a key of a, the side door. So, front doors, back doors are changed, side doors, unfortunately not. Who knows those small racks? Who has those small racks? So, this height, approximately. At the top, there are two rails with brooms like this. Then you can always put your hand in there and reach the inner side of the rack, can't you? After I've taken this picture, they've put Ethernet blocking ports in there. And they also put um, a metal shield on top of this rack. But they created a hole in, on, in this metal sheet of you know, this size. You can still put a cable through that. And if you look closely, this is a gazed front door. It's not a glass door. So with two tweezers, two sticks, we were able to pull out the Ethernet blocking device, put in the cable. So those are things you'll, you have to look for when doing walkthroughs. Well, the obvious things, well, close environments, but the top is widely open here. And a forgotten key on the door as well. And camera systems. And if you look, this, this little thing here in the side is actually an Ethernet port used to control and manage the device or to program the device. Just open it, connect to it, reprogram the camera, do not record everything, close it, done. Nothing will be happening. 
Notice I mentioned TV screens, smart TV screens. But often there's, of course, Ethernet ports, USB ports. Um, I think with the left one, this is also a metal enclosure. We couldn't reach the inner things of the TV screen itself. But the moment we disconnected the cable, the thing rebooted. Just opening the door for the operator jailbreak outs I've talked about last year. USB ports, I'll be coming back on that later on. Who has those external junction boxes on the site or close to the perimeter or whatever? Have you ever verified what is in those junction boxes? This had a Wi-Fi connector and an Ethernet connector onto the internal network. This box was sitting 50 meters away from their front gate. Public street. Everybody can reach it. So what if you have camera protection on your perimeter? They have all those nice junction boxes. You can open the junction box and there's networks in there. What would you be able to hack into? The camera server, probably. From the camera server, you would be able to hop onto the rest of the network, hopefully, and disable physical protection things. So that's a potential way of getting in. So that's why you should be doing combined testing, physical plus human plus logical. Now, for the people who weren't there last year, I've included some things on operator jails as well. So breaking out of operator jails, press on every single key where you can imagine. Um, on touch screens, that's a little bit harder. We can try to get the on-screen keyboard and press virtually every single key. Um, pressing the back key, that's an internet browser here. Selecting back, you can go to the previous page uh, and get interesting information. Or pressing keys on your keyboard, like here, this calculator button. Pops up the calculator and you're free to go. But that's already posted on YouTube, my talk of last year, so I would like to refer off to that talk. What else can you do? Well, abuse every single physical port. Ethernet, USB, serial. Ethernet is easy. Pop in the Ethernet cable, you're free to go. Serial, why do you still mention serial interfaces? Well, a lot of PLCs, a lot of SCADA devices are still using serial, whether it's a normal serial port like the one on the screen, or your USB serial port, or whatever. In a lot of cases, I've seen consoles that were still open or left open on PLCs or network devices. Just disconnected the cable and they're walking away. But the connection was still live. The left thing is actually USB to Ethernet. Why am I mentioning this? Well, imagine you have a, a completely hardened system without a network interface like this. That's a standalone system, no network interface. The reason why some organizations do hardening like that is that it can be a vulnerable system that cannot be patched due to legacy software or something like that. Well, often USB sticks or USB uh, storage drivers are blocked. But what would happen if you add this one to the device? You just have, if it comes, a fully configured network interface. Everything wide open. That's an easy way to get into standalone systems, if it's not patched. Oh, on the remote, I will not cover all the remote things too much today. So, but the remote, find all DSL networks, find all access from IT to IT, uh, OT networks, find the rogue 3, 3G modems like we saw in the Kips game on Monday. And of course, implemented firewall rules have you been testing those already or not? Who is doing port scans against his firewalls to verify the firewalls implemented by IT? Only two people. It's not enough. The reason why I'm telling this, well, last week also, I've been doing uh, just port scans to actual MES system, by the way. They believed the firewall was configured properly by their IT supplier, but everything was wide open. They have never tested everything worked. Thank you. See you next time. Now, the local part is we have done all the physical testing. We have verified all the logical access ports. Now, what can you do with all the logical access ports? 
So we're going to try to determine the logical access of all the discovered ports. This is first the logical, the remote part. We all know Shodan. We all know stories of employees connecting devices to their local network and to the internet at the same time. I can tell you stories like that as well, but I'm not allowed for my customer this time. Um, but on the local network, it's, I think you might all know it. So on the switch access ports, either there's no access, no port security, there's Mac security or .1x. Yeah? In all cases, it's either DHCP or static IPs. I've run into too many occasions where people, engineers, believe that having static IP addresses is a form of security. That's why I mentioned this, no port security. Use network tab, proof that you can just sniff the network and just get into the network by changing IP address. It's basically easy. It's very easy. MAC address filtering. People who know that having static IPs is not enough can either use MAC address security or .1x security. MAC address security is almost always used for systems that do not support .1x. So this can be batch readers, printers, uh, body scanners, things like that. These are almost always using MAC address security. Well, just simply changing MAC addresses is a very easy task. Just sniff the network, find a decent MAC address that you can use. So using the network tab I've shown earlier, and you have the MAC, the MAC address you can use. If static IPs are used, you can use a static IP, and you get access to the network. Do take care if you have a switched environment that is limiting uh, MAC addresses on the ports to single MAC addresses. So that's why you'll have to do other stuff to get onto the network as well with a different system. Who thinks .1x is completely secure and useful within the environment? Nobody. What a surprise. Well, a lot of ICS owners tend to think it is or are or I've been told that it is secure. Well, let's think again, because .1x is just a form of data authentication. If you can bypass this network authentication, you get access to the network. There's a tool to do that, or one tool. It's called Gremlin Marvin. Just acting as a bridge, you have the USB to 2 Ethernet converter I've shown earlier. You use that on one single device. You don't need two devices, as shown in the, in the, on the slide, just one laptop. You run Mar uh, Gremlin Marvin in a virtual machine, and you use your host machine to get access to the network. If you want to use Kali for that, do mind, it's only 32 bits. That's the supported. There has been research as well on that, uh, on DEF CON 19 and uh, the Fenrir tool. So this is on the slide. Uh, you can use it at your own will. If you have network access, now what? So there has been a training the last few two days uh, of Arnaud of ICS pen testing, well, doing Nmap scans, doing Nestor scans, using default ports, all the, let, let's say, basic network testing stuff. Do mind that Nmap does not include a lot of SCADA ports. Nestor does not include a lot of SCADA testing by default. Been there, done that. I've done basic testing. Now what? Am I secure? Well, no. You can still sniff credentials using a tool like Responder that's actually acting as a man in the middle, sniffing all the hashes, NTLM hashes, and so on from your network, if your domain has been configured improperly. Check for unencrypted communications. SQL communications, anybody? Or check Active Directory security with Bloodhound. And of course, embedded devices have web applications enabled as well. A lot of testers forget these nice little web applications. But if you scan them, you will be surprised what might happen. So something else we can do, uh, we have access to the network physically, logically. Imagine we have access to a SCADA network. Well, why not use just engineering tools? A lot of, in a lot of occasions, security has been forgotten or is an option. If you use the TIA portal on the left side of the picture, if you run it first time, you will see almost every Siemens PLC out there. If you use high vision, uh, as of the Hirschman switches, the same thing. 
Or if you use TwinCAD, there's something more I will tell you later on in a few slides on that. Or you can use proprietary communication ways. Now, this slide is not from myself, it's from a researcher, Tel de Nut, and Tinus Umans of the Hoest University. Um, but they did some research on some PLCs on how um, engineering systems communicate with PLCs. Like the Mitsubishi PLCs, they just use broadcast, broadcast packets. And the PLC accepts that. So they created a little script here, send stop, no authentication, as has been mentioned already a few times today. So unauthenticated protocols, don't use them. Or proprietary communication ways, the back-off style. They do implement security, but it's based on TwinCAD routes, and it can play around with those TwinCAD routes. I will not read everything on the slide. I will just show some, show some screenshots that uh, Tail has created to exploit back of systems. So this is verifying communication, uh, connectivity to device, add route, delete route. He found a system, so here, what do you want to do with it? Reboot, shut down, or add route. If he got access to the engineering station, the back of engineering station, what do you want to do with it? Verify communication, browse files, and things like that. Well, if you browse files or upload files, you can upload something like MeterPreter, because Backoff is actually a Windows system. Yeah? And if you run it, you will get a nice shell. It was this light. You'll get a nice MeterPreter shell. You can browse the registry, you can change the registry, all that you want. So actually, this is on a fully patched Windows system. But you're accessing the system through engineering software. Or you can use proprietary tools or proprietary protocols uh, from, for example, Siemens. Just use the Siemens protocols and scan the network for Siemens devices. Do whatever you want with it. If you want to have these scripts, they're all on his GitHub page. So this is on the slides that you can use. Now, what is the best time for testing? Some will say never in live environments. It has been said already today. Some will say during FATSAT testing, of course, always during FATSAT or during revisions. Well, never in live environments, I tend to say, why not? If you know what you're doing, if you have your customer with you, yeah, just make sure that you know your limits. Don't scan, for example, the PLCs that run the system. But the Windows systems, why not? One of my customers gave me a mandate of scanning until you can affect production. That's from a three gigawatt power facility. So I've never run into the occasion that I can impact production yet. But yeah. During FAT set testing, I always say do full multi testing during FAT, security FAT testing. This includes active testing on every single device within factor acceptance testing. During revisions, I used to say during revisions, but now I say during general meetings general meetings with unions, general meetings with the management. Why? Because everything's wide open if they don't have policy of shutting doors, if they don't have batching, if they don't have anything. Everything's wide open, nobody to be seen, passwords all over the place, systems unlocked. I've run into a few of these occasions already. This is nice though. It's very easy for you as an attacker. What can you do? as ICS owner or as consultant working for an ICS owner, perform pen testing on every single new or upgraded device. Do not let devices to be connected to your environment before they are completely and fully tested and scanned. Build your dirty USB stick containing real malware samplers. Yeah, so whatever you can find, the S-word, Stuxnet, uh, Trisys, WannaCry, whatever. Because ACAR alone doesn't prove a thing. This quote is from an antivirus vendor of which I have tested a USB scanning device and there were some malware sample left on the USB stick which was marked as clean, ready to be used on the ICS environment. Malware samples were left behind. That was his response. We don't mark it as effective because it's not well known on VirusTotal. So, 
this slide, I would like to conclude with a, a quote of Mubix at Brucon. So, stop bagging on antivirus. We've seen, we he have seen during the Kips game on Monday that antivirus really has its benefits, even in production environments. You can always catch the low-hanging fruits with the antivirus tools. What else can you do? Well, follow the packets all the way through to your environment. So, consolidated firewall rules overview. If you have, for example, multiple firewall layers, do not look at the firewall layers one by one, but look at everything. Consolidated view. Physical security, detection of presence in your server rooms, ragdoor alarms on your server racks, close or cable throughputs where possible, as tight as possible, and physically lock down racks or enclosures. What else can you do? Well, vendors integrators. I said, I used to say do not trust them, but and now I say trust them, but verify them. And as a vendor, be ready to prove your solution security. I know there's vendors in the room, so be ready to prove it. Show to your, uh, to your customers that it actually works. Because security is no longer a feature. It's no longer an option. It should not be extra being paid for. And as final slide, what can you do? Still use limited scope tests, but extend them. Take a step back and look at your bigger picture. Get your basics straight. And as last quote I use from Ubix, you have to start failures as well as your success. So for all security testers out there, getting caught is also a form of success. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Give you this. And thank you. Thank you. Time for questions. Yeah. Ready? Please have a seat. I've been instructed to not sit in the shadows anymore, so I, <laughs> I have to sit here. Hope that's okay. Yeah, bad points then. All right. So we don't have that many questions. We don't have okay. that much, much time. So um, I'll start with the first one. Um, if you're dependent on the vendor. Uh, how do you uh, address uh, the undressed vulnerabilities that they have or pose? If you have a vendor with an undressed vulnerability, how can you handle that if, if you have to depend on the vendor? With the vulnerability which, for which there's no longer or nor yet a patch or something like that, or you have to mitigate in other ways. So you cannot always patch or solve the vulnerabilities, but if you can mitigate in other ways, you, you can safely or secure a network that way, so. Okay, so, and uh, sometimes I guess you, the mitigations might not be in line with your risk that you want to accept, so. No, everything, you have to measure your risk and your risk that you want to take, of course. Um, depending on that, you can, or you should take your proper risk, uh, mitigation measures. Right, so, can you ever be sure that you have found everything during assessment? No. Nope. That's why you have to do recurring assessments. For so example, the key I showed there, uh, I mentioned that I did four times the same room, only the last time I found that key. It might have been there before, it might not, so that's what I don't know. You are never sure until you do recurring assessments. So, so in, in, uh, but in your work, uh, you act as a consultant. You come in from outside. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so uh, listening to the other uh, presentations, how do you build security from using consultants? Can you repeat that question? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that organizations typically don't want to do is rely on consultants either. So they yeah, want to true. build their own capabilities, right? Yeah. Um, some organizations do not yet have security teams. So that's a matter of, of gaining trust and helping them building in a security team and yeah, doing consulting work at that time. But at a certain moment in time, you have to let go of that customer because then he's mature enough to do his own security testing. Right, so in the testing that you do, do you have anyone from the organization that tag along and try to learn yeah, from always. what you're doing? There's yes. always somebody of the organization tagging along. Good. Always looking on my shoulder. Right. How so it should be done, by the way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, when you've identified the, the state that you're in, the, or the, organ uh, the, the mm -hmm. plant is in, uh, how do you go from that identified state to the wanted state? Well, first of all, this is just the testing that I've shown. Uh, of course, security testing, after that follows a report, which you discuss with the customer, in my case, or internally. 
uh, and that then you take your proper security measures that you want to implement to mitigate the risks and from then on you go further you do redo the security testing to verify if everything has been implemented properly and so on it's a circle yes would you would you say that some of the guys that you work with uh, would like to see it if in the form of projects or can they see it as a continuous program to improve it's a continuous program and they Anyhow. buy into that as well yeah yes good so how do you secure legacy ICS? Um, sorry, I need to think about this question. How, when you do the physical uh, walk around, when you do this testing, mm -hmm. uh, how can, uh, I guess, the people that work there under, know that you are actually not an uh, inside threat or somewhat, you're authorized to do this? That's what I mentioned in my last slide. Mm -hmm. Getting caught is also a form of success. So I walk there unannounced, together with, or sometimes alone, but there's always a contact at the customer side who knows I'm there. And if somebody catches me, yeah, okay, too bad for me, then uh, they call security and I have to explain. Has that happened? Yes. Okay. And That's the uh, fun part, stressy part, but fun part. <laughs> and those guys get promoted? Uh, no, they don't get promoted, but uh, they knew, do know me now and now they say just hi, okay, come along. So. <laughs> so when you put on your black hat, you're, you're already authorized, right? You can just walk right in? Never wear black hats oh, no, okay. on site. Right. Use the hat of the site itself. So, um, uh, some auto systems require to be um, unsecured, logically, for safety reasons. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations? Then you have to try to, if you cannot solve it logically, you have to prevent the physical security or make sure the physical security is properly done. Um, even the human element, then you have to do awareness, making sure that people are not putting something on a network of things like that. So you have to either, if you can do one element, you have to take measures on the other two elements yes. always. Because it's, uh, they all work, all three work together. And so that's why. All right, time's up. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.